coaches. Today, before we get started, I want to thank our sponsor, CoachPad. Uh, no matter if you draw scout cards by hand or use a program on your computer, CoachPad will give you back time by never stuffing a binder again before heading out to practice. First 13.3-inch electronic device allowing coaches to clearly display scout cards outdoors in the sun has been a game changer for programs this past fall and those currently playing all across the country. This new technology allows coaches to coach and not the monotonous task of stuffing and dealing with binders on the practice field. Check out the Coach Pad and Coach Pad Mini on thecoachpad.com. Please make sure you check out our sponsors, our affiliates, and here is another episode of the Gap Down Backer Podcast. Um, welcome back to another episode of the Gap Down Backer Podcast. Uh, today we have a special guest, um, Coach Chip Siegel, who is currently the offensive line coach at Greenville High School in Georgia. But I mean, the man has been throughout the South. Um, we, me and him have talked, kind of has some background, and I think I have probably 15, 20 people asked me to have him on. Um, coach also has a YouTube channel, which we'll talk about a little, in a little bit. But Coach, first, how are you doing? I'm golden, Coach Banster. I really appreciate you having me on, man. I love talking ball. Oh, I appreciate you coming on. And and the one thing I like to do with a lot of my guests before we start is, um, can, can you kind of give? I mean, you can go long or short with this, but kind of your background. I know we talked a little bit about it before we start recording, and you've kind of run the gambit, um, school wise and where you've been. But like, how'd you end up currently at Greenville? What has kind of your coaching trajectory been throughout the years? Well, uh, it all started, you know, I wanted to be a history teacher in junior high school. And then when I got to high school, I said, hey, I want to coach. And they said, you know, you can do both. And so that's how, you know, when people say, how come so many coaches teach history? I said, I don't know about the rest of them, but I wanted to be a history teacher first. And uh, I started coaching. I came out of school in 85 from Troy, Troy University. It was Troy, my diploma says Troy State, but uh, I don't know what it is about pretentious folks these days. And, uh, and I'm, an, I'm a Southern boy, you know, uh, I consider, consider Alabama my home. And I'm currently living in Georgia, retired from the state of Alabama. And uh, started coaching in 85, went back to school, got a teacher certificate. I was at a private school for in the late 80s. And just, I went from a small little public school to a medium sized school, to a big school, to a really big school, to a ginormous school all that over the next 20 plus years. And then in 2009, I said, I want to go back to a small school. I went to a little school with 225 kids and retired 11 and a half years later with seven state championships and about 28 guys signed to play college football from a school that never had more than a hundred boys enrolled in it. Uh, That's not to say we were great coaches. We had some great athletes (laughs) and, uh, and I landed in a hotbed. And it was good. And I retired and I came up, I was living in Georgia all along. I I married my wife who lived in a small town, just 20 miles from the Georgia state line, Alabama's Georgia state lines and found something over here in Georgia that started double dipping, which life is good. You know, when you're double dipping, life is good, bro. (laughs) And then it was like right before the pandemic is when I started doing my YouTube out of boredom because I was only working half days, not because I was retired and I was working half days still in Alabama, but retired from Alabama. And I take a break from it every football season. I don't see how these guys do it that, and I'm not judging it. I'm, I'm envious of it. That they, Their content. And I told my wife, I said, maybe they're binge creating during the off season. That's why time releasing it. That's what you do. Oh yeah, that's that. That's the reason I got through this season. I didn't film anything during this season. I just it it was I had saved up enough, and it, again, it's as I told you off screen, it's borderline unhealthy uh, to film that much. But I mean, that's what I do. I know some people have time because of their schedules; they're able to film some stuff during the week or short videos. But I I don't, especially being a head coach now, I don't have time to film stuff during a. a a football we teach full time and do that. I just don't have time. Yeah, well, that's me. I don't. 
you know, and I because I'm totally immersed. I apologized to my wife years ago, not long after we were together about football. And her first husband was a chef. And she said, oh, baby, don't worry about it. At least you have an off season. <laughs> you know, she said, she, you know, her, her first husband worked six days a week yeah. year round, you know, and I work six and a half days a week during football season. So, yeah. And it's just, and there is an off season to it. So at least there's that. Yeah. Now, and, next, but, next thing I want to hit on with you, and we talked off air a little bit about it, is you evolving a, a offensively throughout the years because I mean obviously I mean we talked off screen about the wishbone and the power bone and that became more veer oriented and that became wing t and that became gun a variation of gun t or spread or what, whatever you want to call it nowadays um, what was that offensive evolution like for you over the past uh, what is it 20 30 years of coaching or wh wherever you're at now because because I mean I mean what has that been like for you? What, what has caused you to change um, and so forth? Well, my roots, as, as we said, are in triple option because I'm a, I'm a child of the 70s. Uh, started playing football in the 70s and graduated high school in 1981. So everybody here in the South was running triple option just about because of the influence of Coach Bryant, you know, over uh, up in Tuscaloosa, and I'll give you an idea how far south I am. Tuscaloosa is the north to me. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so you, you you live in the great white north, Coach. Yeah. To me. <laughs> and uh, when it gets when it gets below fifty here, we start putting on coats, and I mean and parkas. Yeah. But the uh, and so we everybody was triple option, either split back veer uh, or uh, or bone. And when I went to Troy, uh, they were they had been split back beer for beer for years because Charlie Bradshaw had been there. And then the guy that replaced him that I played the majority of my career in college with, I played, I practiced. I, I practiced football at Troy. I didn't play much. And uh, he he brought in the bone, the fish bone, flex bone. And within two years, won a national championship doing it and uh, doing it no huddle. Back in the early 80s, I tell people all the time, they try to say, oh, so-and-so started. And I said, no, 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 no. We were doing no huddle at Troy, you know, nearly 40 years ago. And the offensive coordinator when I was there was doing it in high school in the 70s, no huddle. Now, they didn't get to go high tempo, but if they caught your butt in a shift change, to use a hockey term, a line change, they had a call they could make and line up and run quarterback sneak or fullback dive. they take the result of the play or take the penalty for too many men on the field. And so that's what we did at Troy as well. And so when I – any offense I've been in charge of in the last 37 years or had any influence over what was going on, we've been no huddle. I love uh, George Will, the political uh, commentator, said that football is everything that's wrong with America, violence punctuated by committee meetings. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so and the huddle is the committee meeting. Yeah. And somebody says, well, coach, what do you do when, if you never huddle? What do you do when you want the kids to huddle? I said, you ever had a seen a problem with teenage boys standing around and talking in a group? No, it's no big deal. And the whole I never understood the, the militaristic approach to how you had to stand in the huddle. I still remember that getting in trouble because you weren't standing right. You know, put your hands on your pads and all this. I thought, OK, you know, that's one of the things when I'm coaching, we won't do. And so <laughs> I just don't huddle. And. I've had head coaches that made me huddle in games, but not huddle in practice because I tell them it's a waste of time. Just line up and go. He said, well, they're going to know the play. I said, good, because they're the scout team. If they know the play, that makes them better. Yeah. It makes us have to be better to beat them. They know the play. So we'd go no huddle. And uh, so I was wishbone and triple option, veer. And I did that all through the late 80s and into the 90s. And then in the late 90s, we went wing T. The guy I worked for wanted to go wing T. And – I loved it once I learned it. I hated it before I learned it. And so we stayed, I stayed wing T everywhere I went. I took wing T with me and because it's a great offense. And then when I got to Lynette in 09, about three years in, we had a run of quarterbacks coming that could really go. And so we evolved it to the gun. And the first year we were tight wing with twins one way and running some spread principles back to the twin side and running the buck and running the down and uh, had great athletes, like I said, and not great linemen, but they were tough kids. 
And uh, then slowly in 15 and 16, we didn't have any tight end types. We were a basketball school and we had a lot of tall, skinny kids that could run and jump and go get it. And we just evolved into it. And I would keep that attached H. I call him an H because he's a hybrid between a fullback and a tight end. He's movable. Um, a lot of the spread guys call the H something else. They put him on the line or they put him some, I think the Franklin system, the, the H is the running back. I'm not sure. But to me, the H is a tight end fullback. Yeah. That's why the name H came about. And you say, what? I'm old enough to remember when Dan Henning and the, when he was with the Redskins called it an H and him telling why, because it H stands for hybrid. Yeah. He's a hybrid fullback tight end. And so I call that guy an H and I'll run sh what some people call short buck, you know, guard tackle wing yeah. instead of a tight end. And, um, and so we kept the buck and we, I learned to do some zone stuff. I've, I've toyed with the outside zone this past year at Greenville. We ran no buck. We ran no pin and pull. We were all outside zone, but we didn't have, we didn't have wing T guys. They had been wing T before. And one of the reasons he asked me to come is because I knew zone scheme. He said, we need to run zone. And we had their first winning season since 2011. And, uh, and we weren't great. We were just tough, but the zone scheme was good to us. And, I, and it's one of the few times in 37 football seasons that I could say a team was more – the team a line that I was coaching was would have been better zone team than a wing T principal team. And um, – a lot of people don't understand wing T is not a formation. Wing T is an offense. And the formation to me is irrelevant. What kind of principles are you using to install your offense? What are you doing? And I still consider myself a wing T guy because even in my RPO game, I'm trying to put a player in conflict, Yeah, which is, is was straight up wing T. It's straight up Tubby Raymond. It's straight up Herschel Moore. You're trying to put a player in conflict, like the down and the buck. You're trying to put that defensive end in conflict. Is he going to play the down? Is he going to play the buck? And uh, now I'm from South Alabama, and we don't call it putting him in conflict. We call it putting him in a bind. You got to put him in a bind. And so, and I try to put a, put players in a bind. And that's, and I think, and I tell young coaches, you know, and that's one thing right now that so many guys, young coaches, and this is not a detriment, I, by the way, I love young coaches. By the way, shout out to my, one of my favorite young coaches just won the state championship in Georgia last night, Good. Tucker Pruitt down at Fitzgerald. He was a backup quarterback at Valdosta. And of course, you know what Valdosta does. They're, you know, mummy and all that spread stuff and Chris Hatcher. But he was running, he grinded the ball out last night for a state championship here in Georgia. And Tucker's one of the first young coaches that I visited with five, six years ago. And, uh, and he's one of those that's, tries to marry spread with, you know, old school football. So many young coaches, all they're learning now is spread. And I tell them, you need to learn wing T. And they say, why? And I said, because it teaches you how to build an offense. It teaches you how to build a game plan. It teaches you how to have an answer to everything. And it, there's so many things you can do and not even use wing T principles. I tell, I also tell them you need to learn the Miami four, three or what they call the college four, three, because Heck, right now, everybody's using those principles. Even 425 guys are using my – by the way, the 425 is nothing but a permanent alignment of the Miami 4-3's adjustment to spread. <laughs> that's, that's their adjustment to spread – was their adjustment to spread. And somebody got the bright idea, and I, I don't mean that sarcastically. Uh, let's just make this our permanent defense, you know, because yeah. so many people were spreading it. And I tell coaches, you got to learn a little bit of everything. Just on one of my recent videos – I, I use me as an example. I said, don't be that guy that says, oh, that won't work. Because I was that guy in the 80s and 90s. And it was like in the early 2000s where I realized, you know, everything will work as long as it's sound. You just got to get something that's going to suit your players, which is why we did what we did over at Lynette, marrying the wing T principles. You know, we ran jet like crazy. We ran buck. Uh, we ran the counter. I blocked it the same way I blocked it when we were when we were uh, under center buck. Uh, the only thing I really we didn't run belly. We ran weak lead, but I didn't yeah. call it belly. And uh, and I got away from the rocket. I'd been a big rocket and jet guy because we were so fast. 
And the reason why is because I said, well, that's nothing but a swing pass and gun. And there's some video of us running rocket from, from gun. And I didn't like it because he got the ball so deep and he would run 15 yards and only gain five. And I said, well, that's the, you know, I'm going to use the screen game, the fast, the quick, you know, the quick screen, just stand up and throw it. What we call now passes or pop passes to be my, to be my rocket. The head coach didn't like it. He said, you're going to have to show me. And I said, okay. And, and it was just so expensive to work the jet, the buck and the rocket. Yeah. You know, it's just time expensive. And we had kids going both ways and, and so I had to get rid of something and I hate, I'm terrible at cutting down my offense. Cause I look at it. I garden in the spring and summer down here in, in the deep South and we grow tomatoes and squash. And one year, a couple of years, I planted corn over on the side of the house and my wife hated it. Uh, she loves corn, but she hated the corn plants. Yeah. And it says to plant them so far apart. And then when they start coming up to, uh, to cull some of them, to pull some of them out, to give them space. Well, you know what I did? I couldn't stand to throw them away. So I went over and dug more holes in the ones I pulled out and planted them because I can't stand to waste anything. And uh, I'm the same way with my offense. I can't stand to get rid of something. And it was very difficult for me to get rid of Rocket, but I realized I can't do it all. And, uh, and right now, my offense, if I was in charge of an offense, would only have four run schemes, you know, maybe even three, Buck, jet which is stretch okay and power counter and zone what i call zone my base my my dive play so four you got zone buck jet or stretch and power you said what about counter if you watch my channel i'll tell you power and counter are the same play the offensive line correct 100 and you know the the down blocks and the combination blocks they're all the same thing so i look at it that way and so i got four blocking schemes and that's all the line has to learn. And, and I've learned to do that, to, to use another country term, cull, get rid of certain things. And it's hard to do. But, you know, the Bible does say if something offends you to cut it off. And sometimes too much is offensive to what you're trying to accomplish. And you got to cut that member off. And that's what we've, we've done. And, and that's how I got to where I am now. And, and that's what I've learned a lot because I opened my mind to other things and figured out how to marry it. And what another thing that I say to coaches all the time, when you see a really cool play, don't say, I got to put that in. If it's a really cool play and it doesn't fit what you're doing, you just need to let it be a really cool play, you know, and that's, but I love, but football has made the same journey I've made in the last four decades is now with the RPO game, triple options back. Yeah. But instead of a, a pitch, it's an overhand throw, triple options back. And I love it. And so in my offense, you're going to see in, in my mind, I see wing T schemes. I don't mean wing T formation. I mean, wing T schemes. Yeah. I, I see spread schemes and I see my good old wishbone schemes because I said, that's the guy we're pitching off of. That's the pitch guy. That's the option guy, whatever you want to call him. That's the read. And so all these things I've experienced come together. And, uh, and I love that, you know, and, and I wouldn't take anything for the journey I've been on because yeah. it's brought me full circle. And I think football has gone full circle. And I really predict this. Now, remember, I'm in the deep South. You know, Leach, who is an awesome coach at Mississippi State, has been everywhere he's been. I think he is going to bite the bullet and start RPOing it real soon. I have no inside information. <laughs> I don't because they haven't recruited any of my kids. Uh, so I have no inside information. I've not talked with nobody on that staff, but just during football season, I spend the $40 a month and buy YouTube TV. Yeah. Cause I can record all the games. Yeah. You know, it's worth it. And when football's over a few months later, after I've watched all the videos and what I haven't downloaded, I cut the YouTube TV off, save that 40 something dollars a month. And then come next August, September, I just go on and boom, right back on. And then it watch YouTube TV again because it records all my football games. I get up in the morning at five o'clock and work out on my machine, especially this time of year when it's too cold to run in the mornings. For me, it's 50 degrees. You guys are probably up there running like crazy in 50 degrees. I wish it was 50 degrees here. That's all we'll say. <laughs> yeah. But uh, the, uh, and I watch my games. 
and I watch them and watch them. I see something, I'll dot something down. And that's what I do. And just watching Leach, I really think that the team's like the, the only chance he has eventually of beating an Alabama type team is he's got to put Alabama's defense in a bind. Yeah. And that if you go back and look, you know, you're talking about everybody says athletic quarterbacks. It's not just athletic quarterbacks. Teams that have beat Alabama in the last 10 years have put them in a bind by reading guys, making them wrong. Because that's one good thing about a well-coached defense, which Alabama's going to have because of Saban, is you know where they're going to be because they're well-coached. I'd heap rather play against a well-coached team than a team that just gets out there and runs what I call a bird dog defense. They just go to football, and you have no idea where they're going to line up. So when you know where they're going to be, you can now put them in conflict. You can read them. And I think that what Alabama's done to him the last two years that he's been in the SEC, he eventually is going to know, understand, I got to go RPO. Yeah. You know, and that's one thing Leach has not done. Uh, that, and he's always been on the cutting edge of things. And I think that that's the evolution of the game. And, and again, that's no, that's just me predicting that and by watching it. And, but football has come full circle. I love what the game has become. A lot of people don't like it. You know, a lot of coaches upset. I got a lot of friends on Facebook and Twitter and, and they're always commenting about the uh, the uh, targeting rule. And I said, yeah, I said, it's, and I said, it needs some tweaking. I said, but we got to have it. And they said, why? And I said, we want to keep the game in some fact, reasonable fact, assembly of what it was. We're going to have to make adjustments or the lawyers are going to shut us down. You know, there's lawyers out there right now waiting, you know. And so we have to, you know, we got all this documented evidence. We're throwing these guys out of games for targeting, you know, and that's why there haven't been any major lawsuits lately. Go back to me. There's a direct correlation in the rule changes and the number of lawsuits about concussions and all that kind of stuff, because we're doing things. The rules makers are doing things to save the game. And uh, don't get me wrong. I didn't like that Jamison Williams got, I'm an Alabama fan again, got thrown out of the first half of the Auburn game, you know, but it was targeting. Okay. Do they want to adjust it and maybe not throw them out for a whole game or whatever, or whatever they're going to do? I don't know, but they got to do something to keep the game the way it is and keep the game where it's still football without it. And they said, well, it might as well be flag. And I said, if we don't keep the, if we don't do something, it's going to be flag. Yeah. It's going to be flag because the lawyers and the insurance companies are going to shut it down. And so that's, uh, but I got off on a rant there. I'm sorry, coach master, uh, yeah. but football, to me, is in a good place. I like what we're doing offensively. Um, on, I see it all over the country. Uh, I message random dudes and say, hey, can you send me video? <laughs> you know, just because I want to see what they're doing. Well, that's my next question to you is how, like, obviously you've evolved tremendously over, I mean, in a way. I mean, it's football sick, football sick rule. I mean, as you kind of mentioned, I mean, triple option is just now an RPO. I mean, it's Football is cyclical. All, all becomes new again, just a different way to show it. Um, but how – when you're looking to learn something new or add something new, how do you get that information? Do you go to specific people? Do you uh, – obviously, you mentioned getting video there. How do you go about that process of learning new schemes or adding new to your offense? All right. Clinics are wonderful. I look at clinics this way. You go there to get ideas. OK, if you can get one or two ideas every time you go to a clinic, that's good. But once you hear that, you're not going to get an install plan at a clinic. Yeah. You know, a, a Gla Glazier's awesome. Um, you know, the, um, Roger Holmes over in Dublin, Georgia, right in the middle of Georgia here, just the other side of Macon for me, does the best pound for pound clinic I've ever been to. You ever get a chance, you got to fly down. Heck, I'll come to Atlanta and pick you up, drive you to Dublin if you want to go. I've listened to Coach a couple of times at Glazier's. He is amazing he's the dude yeah he's the dude and uh and i tell people all the time a glacier is great but you know but and rogers clinics obviously smaller but anyway clinics are great but you're not going to get the whole picture so here's what i do i go to clinics i get ideas now with the internet social media i get on a, I, I tell old coaches this when i say old i mean guys my age you go oh social media is dumb and i said if you're a football coach and you're not on twitter you're guilty of professional malpractice because it is a clinic every friggin' day if you follow the right people. Yeah. You know, I got a buddy that's a DC 
Tennessee down in South Georgia. We used to work together in Alabama back in the old days, uh, almost back in the canvas strap helmet days when we were both young coaches. And he's, he wasn't on it. He said, really? He said, you think that? And I said, yeah. And so we set him up a Twitter account. And he said, now, what do I do? I said, go to my Twitter, see who I follow and follow them. Because my Twitter is all coaches. Yeah. You know, I don't, it's all, if I follow you, you're a coach or you're somebody that's a real close friend that I just want to follow. And I get that stuff. And then, so I get that stuff off social media, the videos, all that. And then if it's something I really want, okay. I call them and I go visit them or I call them and say, can you send me video? The go to colleges, the best people with the GAs and the, uh, the limited earnings coaches. Cause they're the ones that do all the, they're, they're, they're not doing the game planning. They're typing it all up. They know the stuff and they want to share it. They're trying to network. They want to talk with high school coaches. If you're lucky enough to get to sit with an OC. Now this is the good thing. We had a run there, some really good athletes over in Lynette, in East Alabama. And you had Nick Saban came in. Um, Gaddis came in, who's now at Michigan, Royals Award winner. Um, Loxley, who's at Maryland, he came in. All right, uh, Gonzalez, who was the DB coach at Florida, came in because he was there with, uh, uh, with the staff that just got fired. And then there were several others. That was just off the top of my head. Oh, Mario Cristobal came in. All right, and then – and we would tell them to say, well, uh, we'll go get them out of class. But uh, no, we didn't do this to Saban. <laughs> he said, uh, but you got to show us something first. And they get on the board. My, the way I run my quick game, my quick passing game, not quick like slants, but like the fast screens and the way I call it and the way we block, you know, most dangerous man and all that kind of stuff. I got that from, um, from Trickett, who was the quarterback right. at West Virginia, Coach yeah. Trickett's son. Okay, he was in the office and he was waiting and he said, well, when's he going to get here? I said, oh, I hadn't called yet. I'm waiting for you to show me something on that board. <laughs> you know, you go to, if, if, that's, if you're going to talk to my kids, you got to give us something. Yeah. And that was a great way. If you're fortunate enough to have kids that are being recruited, when those guys come in, don't just give them, uh, you know, availability to your kids and let them get, because they want to talk football, especially the young assistant coaches. They want to talk football. And, um, uh, when Coach Saban come in, we didn't do him that way. Now, Gaddis taught me a lot about the RPO game. That's why I became a big Moorhead guy. Because when I realized, you know, at one time, just a few years ago, Moorhead was at Mississippi State. Brady, Joe Brady, was at LSU. Gaddis was still at Alabama. And, uh, and Sarkeesian, all those RPOs he ran, he got from Gaddis. Anyway, there were like four programs in the top 25 at one time that were all running – either versions of Moorhead's offense or yeah. flat out running Moorhead's offense. You know, Joe Moorhead is. I know he, I he's, he's not right down the road. He's, he's two and a half hours from me now at Akron. Like, I mean, that's. Yeah. I mean. And that, that may be a trip I make because I've dropped in some emails. Uh, the free safety, one of the free safeties out at Oregon played for us in Lynette, Alabama. Yeah. A little town of 6,000 people's got a kid playing at Eugene, Oregon on the other coast. And I said, and then, of course, he left, and we knew he was going to leave. And so I'm going to try to contact him and see if we can go up and sit with him because I've got everything I could get on Moorhead and guys that played for him. And Gaddis is the one that turned me on to it. And we started doing RPOs in 16 when they were recruiting uh, the kid that's in Oregon and, of course, the one that's at Alabama now. Yeah. And uh, when they were, like, in ninth, tenth grade, they started recruiting them. That's how good these kids were. Again, it wasn't great coaching. It was – a decent coach that had some good talent that uh, made us all look better. But that's – I loved uh, visiting with those guys. And so that's my point. The, to me, the evolution of knowledge is going to clinics or getting on social media, getting exposed to it, and then finding somebody who knows more about what it is. And then just – and don't be afraid to say, hey, coach, this is so-and-so, dropping them a line just like you hit me up on Twitter – through a private message and yeah. had no way of getting up with me. And just, I did it with a team that runs sure enough, something I don't want to run, but <laughs> true wing T gun wing T. I mean, yeah. it's true wing T out of gun, you know, with three backs in the backfield. I'm not going to do that unless that's what my talent dictates because I love those spread principles and the RPOs, but I hit him up and, uh, I'll be John Brown, but in three days, he sent me his entire season of offense. Yeah. On huddle. I got it all. And he said later, he said, I'm going to send it to you, Tag. He goes, hey, he said, uh, 
I was talking to one of our assistants that knows you, a young guy. He goes, maybe we can get together and you can show me your RPO game out of wing T, out of off the wing T stuff. And I said, absolutely. Again, yeah. I love talking ball. Yeah. And, uh, but, oh, and so that's, it, well, it, look here, I'm, I'm like a little toy. Just wind me up and I'll go, Coach Master. I, I, hey, hey, it makes my job simple. If I just got to ask a question and you have – it's good. I, I mean, before, before we get into it, because I, I do want to, before we go, talk down a little bit. But um, before we get to that, like your YouTube channel, like obviously, I mean, I'll it'll be in the bio. Um, but, like, I I've, I followed you before we started talking. I didn't put the connection, and we've talked about that already. But, I mean, you have everything under the sun on there. Um, I know there's a bunch of stuff on like gun buck sweep. Um, I know I'm, there's some RPO stuff. There's, there, I mean, there's, I mean, coaches just check it out, but what, what kind of led you to that? And then kind of, how's that going? Do you just talk about your YouTube channel for a minute? Let's just make it simple. All right. It's football talk with coach chip. If you type it, now if you type in coach chip, it depends on the day. Apparently either going to get me or chip Kelly. Okay. <laughs> but if you type in football talk, coach chip, you'll get me. And uh, what happened is I retired at the end of the 18th season, halfway through the school year, and started right back in January working half days. Um, in some states, they call it limited earnings. You can make so much money if you're retired. Da -da 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 -da. And I started doing that, just doing the weight room, keeping the fit, doing everything I'd done before except the teaching, and which was fun. And so I was kind of bored getting up in the mornings, you know, go for my runs, do my workout, all that. And uh, my wife one day was watching me or he heard me listening to, I can't remember who it was. It could have been Coach Mackey. It could have been Coach Mack for, out of Florida. Uh, there were two of the guys. It could have been you because I was watching your stuff. It was, there's countless of them on there. And uh, she said, you can do that. And I think now I look back on it, and she was just trying to give me something to do to get out of her hair, okay? <laughs> and because uh, – uh, and so I just started doing it. And it was just like I'd set up the camera. I didn't even have a tripod. I would prop it up. I'd go to school early, like 10 in the morning, which yeah. was early. I didn't have to be there until 1230. And um, I'd just prop it up. And I'd get on a board in an empty classroom and start doing stuff. Some of the original stuff I did, you go back and look at it. The very first one I ever did was sitting right here where I'm sitting now. And I had a little board propped up against the fireplace right here. OK, and I was writing on it and a good friend of mine that's a media type said, you don't need to do that thing anymore. Is it looks like a floating head. Your head keeps coming into the camera, my head floating. Around. And uh, so I evolved and then I bought a, um, a program um, screen -o that I can do sc screen captures, video screen captures of my huddles and stuff like that and other games. And uh, and then I, uh, I bought a tripod and uh, stuff like this. and. It just, I got better at it. And I got a really good friend who's about in his mid thirties. That's a, a YouTuber, but he's also works for two, four, seven sports. He, he does this thing called the late kick with Josh Pate. Yeah. It's out of Nashville. It's the best college. Now I'm partial because I love him. You know, I would say like a son, but more like a nephew. And, <laughs> and, uh, and he's, he knows all the ins and outs of it and told me, and he helped me a lot with production value and telling me what to do and how to tag things. I said, what's tagging? Got it. I mean, I'm into this stuff, but I don't know all this stuff. I honestly got to think if you're younger than 40, you were born with some kind of innate knowledge of computers that people my age, you know, I was born at the tail end of the baby boom in 1962. Yeah. I'm into computers. I love them, but I don't know jack crap about them. And I said, show me how to do that. My son-in-law was here last weekend. He's a professional hacker, literally. He's paid by the federal government. And he set up my new computer. I panicked when you said Zoom. I said, this computer's new. I don't know if I can Zoom on it. And uh, I almost called him. I said, what do I got to do? But it, it worked. You sent me the link. I clicked on it. I followed the prompts right to it. It was easy. And that, that's what led me to it. You know, just wanting to talk football. And, and if there's nobody around, I live in this small town with my – beautiful smoking hot wife, but she don't want to talk football. Yep. And so I, I can get on the talk to the camera and hopefully talk to right now, hopefully dozens or hundreds of guys, one day, hopefully thousands and, uh, and just talk ball. And I love it when they comment, 
you know, and everybody, one of the things I say on my, my videos all the time, Coach Banstra, am I saying your name right? Yep, perfect, Banstra? actually. Banstra, very good. Yeah. Um, the um, That comes from 37 years of calling role in a classroom. You learn how to pronounce names. <laughs> oh, it, it's been butchered many a times in a classroom, so don't even worry about it. This. So the uh, thing I thought where I forgot where I was going to go with that. What was I saying? Oh, um, God, you made me lose track because you're talking about rolling the classroom. Um, I chase rabbits so much. I forget. Yep, what you talked about your hacker son loading Zoom. Um, yeah. And the production. They're talking about, yeah. Oh, but, but so I just started doing. Oh, here's what I say in things. I say things like if I got it and you don't, it's because you ain't ask. There you go. That's what I was going to say. If I got it and you don't, it's because you ain't asked. I've had some coaches. I got some pretty good friends that are doing this stuff that we've become friends. Some I knew beforehand and some I've met since the whole YouTube thing that they're, they're selling everything they got, which is fine. I, I, I do not begrudge them. Make a living. I'll never question yeah. a man's money. You know, I don't care. I don't care that uh, Brian Kelly is going to get a hundred million dollars. <laughs> good for him. Good for, yeah, good for him. Exactly. Exactly. Good. God bless him. It's good work if you can get it. Yep. You know, and uh, Mel Tucker, 95 million. Good for him. Good work if you can get it. I don't believe anybody's overpaid. When when colleges start going bankrupt because of what they pay coaches, then I'll say somebody was overpaid. Yeah. I'm not going to mess with your money, but I don't feel good about selling stuff that I was given to me. Yeah. And that's, and, and that's just me. I do not question anybody. There was a big debate going on Twitter a year ago, and they were, like, ripping some of these guys, you know, about And I said, dude, that's the way they're making money, you know. And yeah. I'm not going to rip anybody for making money. Good for them. I hope one day I, Google sends me a check for my YouTube channel. I mean, I don't think they're ever going to send me as much as some of these cats are getting because <laughs> um, I'm just not that good at it, I reckon. You know, um, probably I shouldn't do videos because I, I have a radio face you know, a face for radio. Uh, but I I want to share. I want to share because somebody shared it with me. The guys that have sat down with me for the last nearly 40 years didn't charge me. You know, and let me tell you something. Nobody's getting rich on speaking at clinics. I've spoken a few. Mm -hmm. You cannot put food on the table speaking at right. clinics. That's, that's beer money at best. Okay. <laughs> that's a, at best. And, uh, so you're not going to get rich speaking at clinics. So they're not like sponging us. Um, but now I am going to do books. I'm going to do it. I've already started on my, uh, I started a book about the whole offense during the pandemic and football started back earlier here than it did for y'all up North. Yeah. Um, well, you know, we take it more serious than y'all do. That's sarcasm coach. So I, <laughs> I tell all my friends from other parts of the country, I said, y'all don't take it as serious as we do. And uh because we didn't care about COVID, apparently. You know, they say, yeah, you can go back. You can coach them from six feet apart. Yeah, that tried doing that. Yeah. Um, that's what I'm – okay, that, I'm not going to chase that rabbit. And uh, so we just started doing these things. I started doing these things just because I love talking ball. So I started writing the book, and then football started back. Well, now I've, I've got the – oh, I'm going to tell you, this is an unsolicited, unpaid plug – I love the My Just Play app or My Just Play program, whatever it is, on mine. I paid the money for it. The guys on another podcast, I won't mention another podcast on yours, but they uh, they they, so it, they sponsor their podcast. And so one day I said, I'm going to check it out. So I went to it and I played with it and I said, I can do this. And so I started doing that. And so now what I'm doing, I'm building 101 ways to run the buck. Okay. And 101 ways to run the jet or in, and plays off the buck and plays off the jet. And I'm going to make them into two Google books, like maybe Google slides where you give people to, you know, give them the access to it. I'm going to sell those simply yeah. because of the time factor. I'm not selling the football. I'm selling my time. I'm not going to sell them for an exorbitant amount of money, but because of the time put into building it. Yeah. Because my time is valuable to me, but my knowledge of football, I'm giving it away because somebody gave it to me. You know, it was a gift. Nobody, you know, none of these old coaches, some of them that are, have gone on to the, you know, to, to the end zone in the sky, they gave it to me. And um, 
we, I paid guys to come to schools. Um, Wes Elrod, who was a legend in Tennessee, he came from the Herschel Moore Wing T School of Thought. Uh, twice I paid him to come and speak to me, speak to me and my staff at two different schools that I was OC. And he charged me, but it wasn't worth the time that he put into it. It was just enough to justify him coming, yeah. to be honest with you. And uh, I mean, just he charged me for his time, but his knowledge, what he gave me about football, heck, the video I just did on the double double team that I just dropped this morning, that's something that he's talking about football evolving. That is an old thing he did at a wing T back in the 60s and 70s. He called it doo doo. He said, because the kids will remember when you call it doo-doo. It stands for double-double team. And so I evolved it into a spread look, running the doo-doo. Two double teams at the point of attack, which, by the way, all duo is, is Coach Elrod's doo-doo. Everybody, everybody's gone nuts over the duo, which is a great scheme. But it ain't new. It's just a new way of dressing up an old scheme. People have been running running double-double teams probably since the days of Newt Rockney All-American, you know, and uh, Pop Warner, not the, the youth football Pop Warner, the Pop Warner, the one that coached uh, Jim Thorpe, have been running double-double teams, two double teams at the point of attack. And so duo is the big thing now. I got a friend just won state championship in Alabama in 5A, which is pretty big football and pretty good football in Alabama, running three schemes, stretch, duo, and counter. That was their run. That was their run game. Stretch, duo, and counter. And uh, and of course, passing and all that off of it. So duo is a great concept. But it ain't new. It ain't new. Just like the old zone guys will tell you, the original NFL guys that did the zone, they said, that ain't new. It's not new. You know, a lot of people have been doing inside zone on the backside of stuff. Heck, the split back veer guys were doing inside zone on the backside of option back in the 60s when Yeoman first invented it. And uh, so there's nothing new. We just dress it up different, present it. You used the word a while ago, presenting things differently. You know, now we're doing it out of spread, but it's still there. Uh, it, it's always been there. It's football. It's not brain surgery. You know, I, I know it's not complicated and it's not hard because I've made a living doing it. If it was complicated and hard, I wouldn't be doing it. Because I'm not, a, I'm, I'm not, I'm not a rocket surgeon or a brain scientist. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> so. Now, the next thing I want to ask you before we go is, is and we kind of talked about this in messaging each other is I, the one thing I've always, I don't know how one word this down belly G, wherever you want to call it to me, it's down. It will always be down. I, I understand. It is down. Every yeah. commentator wants to call it belly G. Um, but I've, I've always, and you, you've, you've t- tried a little bit. Of the, obviously under center is beautiful. Um, I've always wanted to try to figure out how to time it up out of the gun. Um, I, I know I've seen Coastal Carolina run it a little bit um, and what they do. A lot of times they, they time it up a little bit better because they pull their center instead of a guard. Um, but have you – how much – have you messed with it? Um, I know a buddy of mine, they were able to kind of mess with it a little bit with quarterback running it, not really a running back from a timing standpoint. That's how, that's how I've done it. Yeah. I've never done it with the back. Okay. Now there's a guy uh, not too far from me that did it with a with a back, uh, about 20 miles from here, and I was corresponding with him when he was summarily released from his contract. So uh, I got to catch up with him, but he was doing it uh, at a gun with a running back. Now the way I did it, and I'll send you some film. Stay on me about it now that you got my email of us doing it about five years ago with the kid now that's at Alabama when he was in ninth grade and his brother was the starting quarterback. Well, the younger brother was bigger and thicker. So we had a package we called Texas because at the time, Texas had that great big kid that played quarterback and they ran him a lot in short yardage. I can't remember his name. Oh, God, what was About five years ago. I can't remember. Great big kid. He was built like a frigging tank. I won't say his last name started with like a B or something. Uh, I can't remember for the life of me. I know who you're talking about. I just don't remember what his name is. Yep. 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 But we called the package Texas and little brother, who was the bigger of the two, younger brother would go in at quarterback and we were a big jet team. So we'd run and and it was short yardage. And so we'd have a tight end in the game and we would run down off either run jet or down, down off the jet, by the way, even under center to center 
down off a jet. I'm surprised defensive coordinators have not tried to get it outlawed. <laughs> talking about you talking about putting a nine technique in a bind. Mm-hmm. I mean, and they, you can tell them all day long not to look at that jet motion. They will tell them. We're, we're talking 15, 16, 17 year old kids. You know what I'm talking about? You know, they're thinking about other things like girls, school, football, girls, food, girls. Okay. Mm. They're not thinking like we are, you know. And so, and I ran it that way. And then I tried running it out of my spread look with my attached H and a split in, no tight end. Couldn't get it to time up. Yeah. Use the backside guard, timed up perfectly. Now, I know that's not true down but it has the same effect. We're hitting that C gap. Yeah. There's one gap yeah. tighter because there's no tight end. Okay. And we'd rocked it just like, and you also had the extra down block when these guys try to put an A gap D lineman to the play side. Okay. The guard on the play side blocks down. Of course, the center's blocking back. The tackle's blocking down. The wing, the H as I call him is fake blocking down and going around to, to the inside linebacker, just like he does on wing T. And the backside guard is pulling and kicking. And now it's the same as my counter for them, for the linemen. Just no wrapper. It's just boom. It's a great short yardage play. You run it off a jet or you could get in sidecar and do a sweet fake to the running back. And then if you got that athletic quarterback or a bruiser at quarterback that can get you two yards when you need it, all it is now is a long trap. Yeah. And, uh, and we even called it Dallas for down even though we were pulling. And I know the true wing T guys will say, hey, wing T. I know, I know, because I was a true wing T guy, and I've said the same thing. But you do what you got to do. But the the effect on the defense, to me, is the same as down. And the pulling the center thing has always fascinated me because I've only had one that could do it, that could snap and pull. And maybe it's a coaching flaw on my part, but I've only had one that can do it. And, of course – my criteria for for being center has it since I've gone gone. Who's the best snapper? And can you block back and get in the way? Yeah. If you're the best snapper, you get. I mean, I had a. We went eleven and two about ten years ago with a hundred and fifty pound center. Okay, who had thought he was a quarterback two years before, and he was skinny as a rail, but he could put that money. He put that ball on the money, and all he had to do was block back on everything. Yeah. You know, and that's that's why I started pulling. If you look at one of my Buck Sweeps videos um, about how to stop run throughs on the Buck Sweep, and I don't call it Buck Sweep to the kids, I just call it Buck because I don't want them to think sweep. Because sometimes young kids they hear sweep, they want to run outside. Um, is I pull tackles, yeah, okay. Because I started doing that when I realized my center can't block that that shade nose. He can't block the, what do you want to call him, a one or a two eye. He can't do it. And the tackle sometimes, I started doing it with the tackle, blocking him all the way down to him. That doesn't always work if that A-gap D lineman is athletic at all. Yeah. He's going to beat the tackle. So I just started doing it, and I've got a scheme for it where I say, if anybody's in your gap, you're down. And they communicate with each other. And you say, well, what do they say? I don't know. Whatever that group of kids wants to say to each other. I tell them, you come up with the calls. Just tell me what they are. When I hear you say them in inside run, I know what you're doing. I always let the kids come up with their calls. So yeah. The linemen love that. Give them a sense of ownership on what they do. Just make sure it ain't. It's cool. It's so, appropriate. Yeah. yeah. Well, make sure that if yeah. you have to say it loud on a Friday night, you don't offend the superintendent's wife. Exactly. Okay. And so – but we let them come up with the calls and they communicate who's pulling. And now in my system, because I haven't had those great uh, centers, my center's blocking back every time. Yeah. The backside guard is wrapping every time. And who's pulling? Either the front side guard, the front side tackle. And if I have him with, a, with an H2, a tight end can pull too. And I got that from Roger. Roger will block that wing down and he'll pull and kick with his tight end. Yeah. And I'd go, holy crap, <laughs> you know. So here I am, a spread, kind of a spread guy, you know, running a lot of spread schemes, getting stuff from an under center guy who always jokingly says RPO means run power often. Uh, Roger loves he, saying that. He does. Okay. I think he says it about every clinic. <laughs> oh, yeah. And uh, he uh, 
so I learned from that. I'm still, I mean, if you can't learn a little bit from somebody, then yeah. you don't have an open mind and uh, you don't have, my dog may start bark, barking because my wife just came home okay. and uh, we can take the garbage out and we come back in. He acts like we've been gone for six months. You know, oh, you I know, home. I know. Trust me. I'm what yeah. I've, had, yeah. I've had plenty of dogs. They freak out immediately. Somebody so, else. But that's how I block down okay. is when I run it is I pull the backside guard if I don't have a tight end. Okay. You know, and I haven't had a tight end for a while. Where are all the tight ends these days? I know. I, I got a couple tight end body. Well, kids that will play tight end, but they're not like, they're not true tight ends. They're, they're H backs and full backs. That's what they are. But I mean, that, I mean, that's, that was kind of my curiosity is kind of how you handle that. Because like I said, I've seen coastal coastal's done a little bit with a guard front side, but usually they're, they're pulling their center. On, on their variation of down most of the time. Um, and like I said, I've, we, we tried it a couple of years ago when we ran some gun stuff. It just never timed right. It just, I don't, it, it obviously, it, it's supposed to be a fascinating play anyways. Um, so that's, that was kind of my curiosity. And I know teams that had, had as far as there. timing goes, as far as timing goes, I don't know what the rules are in Ohio. Are you able to get your hands on your kids during the off season? Um, sort of like we get, um, what we call seven mans. So we're allowed to do some stuff with football with seven kids at a time, like pods in the summer, yeah. in the summer, it's pretty much unlimited days. Now they made that yeah. change once COVID hit, um, and they're not going back. They're working on spring ball here. Um, but we'll see. There's been a push for that for years. I think we're the closest to it. We've been since COVID's hit. Because they were going to run a trial run before COVID, and that kind of halted that. Um, we'll see what happens. I'll, I'll, I'll believe it when I see it. I know we're probably as close as we've been to it, but our our biggest problem with run, having true spring ball here is because of winter. Baseball doesn't start as early. Baseball and track start a month or two after this. It starts in the south. It just does. So everything we're starting late January. Yeah, I mean we're we're not starting late February March. For baseball and track stuff so I mean that's that's always going to be the hindrance here especially since you don't have like mass indoor facilities across the state um but yeah I mean that's so we sort of do um I I would love to get spring ball but we'll see what happens but I was going to say you get in the summer you get garbage cans and you get out there and you toy with it this is what I've done when I put new stuff in you know, I don't do it during the season. Yeah. But you get out there, you get garbage cans because you can't have the bags. In Alabama, you couldn't have the bags. In Georgia, you can use bags on some occasions. Of course, in Georgia, we have 11 on 11 padded during the summer. You know, we, and you can go do 11 on 11 versus other. As long as there's at least three or four schools is the rule. And I've only been here two years, so I'm not an expert on Georgia. But, you know, 35 years in Alabama, I can tell you all about that. But Anyway, get the garbage cans and start playing with it with your quarterback. Your quarterback's going to make it right. If you want to do the jet or the sweep fake out of it, or if you want to do it out of pistol or same side or whatever, I think pistol would be – that fascinates the crap out of me. Can you run down out of pistol? Yeah. And get out there and just toy with it, have your line come off, blocking their garbage cans, you know, go into their blocks and play with it. So, okay, quarterback, try this. And you may have to do it where you don't reverse out. You know, we did that under center. We have a slow quarterback that couldn't reverse out and get down the line, and the fullback kept beating him to the point of attack. We just tell him, don't reverse out. Just come out like this, face out like it's a dive. Yeah. You know, and th just to get him there. Because the point to me is, is getting the ball at that spot, you know, and the blocking is what puts the nine technique in a bind. It's not what goes on in the backfield. Please, God, give me a nine technique that's watching the backfield. OK, yeah. we may score 90 on that cat, but I think that's what you do. And that's what, and all I did was sitting there when we first started doing it without a tight end. It didn't take me long to say that ain't working. I said, hey, block down, backside guard, you pull kick D in. And I said, boom, there, there, there's our counterplay without a wrapper. Yeah, you guys already know how to do this. Down, down, down. Back, pull kick. And, and that's what we did. And we called it down, even though, like I said, you know, Tubby Raymond probably rolled over in his grave when he heard me do it. You know, but. 
All right, Coach. Well, I'm gonna wrap it up right here. So just stay, in, just pretty much just sit there, and I'll I'll go through my little spiel real quick. Um, coaches, uh, make sure you like, share, subscribe, all that lovely stuff. Uh, make sure you check out Coach's YouTube channel. That link will be in the bio of this video as well. So make sure you check out the his stuff, like, share, subscribe, his stuff as well. Um, and that's really it. Thank you again for listening to Gap Down Backer Podcast. Appreciate it. Um, and hope everybody stays safe and healthy.